Thank you very much for joining us today. Our webinar today is called Digital Decarb, Using Smart Technologies to Cut Emissions. I'm Verena Radulovich. I'm the Director of Corporate Engagement here at the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions. For those of you that may be less familiar with our work, C2ES, as we're called, is a nonpartisan, nonprofit research organization committed to advancing climate solutions and the technologies and policies that promote them. We catalyze business action through our, our growing Business Environmental Leadership Council, which is a group of Fortune 500 companies that are all committed to addressing climate change. And we bring together stakeholders of different perspectives, different sectors, and we do this to build common ground. And I also especially want to flag our Climate Innovation 2050 initiative, as well as our Getting to Zero policy report, uh, which you can check out for Getting to Zero by 2050. Today, C2ES and our guests are really grateful to have you with us for a discussion on the role of digitalization in helping to advance a decarbonized economy. We're gonna look at what digitalization looks like within different sectors, how it can enable emissions reductions, and why policy is really necessary to ensure that digitalization can advance decarbonization. There will be opportunities for the audience to ask the panel questions throughout the webinar, so we'd like this to be a dynamic conversation. So please use the questions tab on your control panel to get those in, and we'll do our very best to address them throughout the webinar. Finally, I do wanna say, uh, put a plug for our Twitter account. Um, you can stay connected to us by following us on Twitter at, at C2ES underscore ORG. I'll also note that this webinar is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube site uh, within 24 to 48 hours after the webinar. You can go to our website, www.c2es.org under events to find it. So today we're really lucky to have four speakers that are gonna provide a very um, comprehensive as well as nuanced perspective on the role of digitalization in advancing the low carbon economy. First, we have Bill Abel, who is Vice President at AECOM, focused on energy and sustainability. We have Steve Harper, who is Senior Director, Environment and Energy Policy at Intel Corporation. Nanette Lockwood, who's Global Director of Climate Policy at Train Technologies. And on the phone with us today, we have Cameron Prell, Head of Government Policy and Legal at Expansive CBL Holding Group, which is known as Exchange. Before we get started, I wanna take a moment to define digitalization, as I know that this is a term that means different things to different people, but I think as we find throughout our conversation, we are surrounded by it, we live in it, we may not even realize just how connected we are to it. And therefore, I wanted to take a moment to kind of lay the groundwork uh, that will be for our, our, uh, our webinar. You may have heard the term digitization, which is um, moving information from analog to digital. Uh, many of us have gone through this process over the last 20 years. Digitalization, which is the focus of this webinar, is the analysis and use of that data and the application of that data. So feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar. Um, if there's a point in which you're confused, uh, we are here to answer those questions and to really debunk the mystery of digitalization and why this is such an important component to, um, to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So our distinguished panel is gonna offer some specific examples of what it means in practice, implications for policymakers. We're gonna get into all that. Um, and as I ask them to start, I'm gonna ask them to introduce um, kind of what they, what their company is about and how it relates to digitalization and some of the key points that we're gonna focus on in the webinar. Steve, I'm gonna start with you from Intel. From your vantage point at Intel, what do you see in terms of the broad opportunities for using digital tools to decarbonize um, our economy? Well, thanks, Irina, <clears throat> for this opportunity. It's great to be with the fellow panelists in the audience. Um, so as you said, I'm with Intel. <clears throat> Excuse me, we, um, we typically refer to digitalization as the handprint. <clears throat> Excuse me, I get all choked up when I talk about this topic. Um, <clears throat> so every, every industry, every person has a footprint. That's your direct negative impact on climate, water, whatever the environmental um, outcome is. But very few industries have what we call a handprint which is the ability of your technologies and your solutions to help other parts of society, other industries, reduce their own footprint. And, and that's through the digitalization that you referred to, Verena, in your opening remarks. At Intel, people know Intel as a company that makes chips that are pretty much scattered throughout uh, society, the fundamental technology of a lot of ICT. Um, but we also are involved in um, making and working with our partners to provide other kinds of solutions that fit in the handprint realm. 
the best way to understand the handprint, I think, is by uh, examples as opposed to a broad, you know, conceptual metaphor. And I'll just cite two examples of uh, Intel technologies that fit the bill. The first is we've got some technologies that we've rolled out with uh, air conditioning manufacturers that basically outfit commercial chillers with IoT sensors and with um, um, uh, data uh, gateways that allow somebody, say, with a Coldwell, bank, uh, Coldwell real estate, uh, Coldwell banker real estate, sit in an office a thousand miles away and monitor a thousand different machines that are cooling 100 or 150 different warehouses. And that person sitting at the terminal can optimize those machines for energy efficiency, to have them do maximum chilling when the price of electricity is lowest, and also to spot parameters of operation that may signal the need for preventative maintenance. So that's, that's one example of the handprint uh, in effect powered by IoT. Uh, another one is a more recent development. We've been working with Southern California Edison and some other partners like VMware to develop projects that essentially do what we call flatten the substation. The substation on the distribution side of the electricity network, typically those machines are very old, um, sometimes 50, 60 years old, and they're very inefficient, and they don't provide any two-way flow of communication between the customer and the utility. We have worked with Southern California Edison, also the Salt River Project in Arizona, to develop uh, digital substations that have a much smaller footprint, also have two-way communications capability, provide opportunities to integrate a lot more renewables onto the grid, and provide a wide range of energy and climate solutions. Uh, and you know, semiconductors are the foundational technology of these solutions, but this is really a network story, not just a chip story or a server story. Um, and this is really taking off with the advent and the expansion of IoT capabilities and artificial intelligence. Uh, within Intel, we just recently, this spring, announced our RISE strategy of a series of commitments on environment and social responsibility looking out to 2030. And one of our major uh, goals is to use our technologies and work with our partners to expand the handprint in the economy. Uh, the key is scaling. There, there's technology out there, but unless it scales, um, it's not going to make a big difference in the world's climate footprint. And the key to scaling, quite frankly, is policy. And you hear, hear a lot more about that later on. There are a number of policy barriers that need to be overcome to permit the scaling at the pace that is needed to address climate change. Finally, I just wanna mention um, both Train uh, and Expansive uh, who are on this call are also members with Intel of something we've recently formed called the Digital Climate Alliance. Digital Climate Alliance is intended to be a, a set of ICT companies like Intel and digital companies like um, Train and we define that to be companies that embed a lot of digital content in their solutions to help uh, advance policies that enable the expansion and scaling of the handprint story. And we'd love if anybody online is interested in knowing more about DCA to contact me or to contact uh, Nanette uh, or Cameron to find out more. So that's a good introduction, hopefully, Verena. Thank you so much, Steve. Yeah, I think a lot of us think of semiconductors in our phones and our computers, not realizing that they are also applied to substations and in building automation systems. So with that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Bill. And Bill, I think you know there's an idea emerging and, and, and uh, Steve talked about it in the ways in which our built environment could actually be considered um, you know, helpful in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. There's also been discussions of buildings being used as resources rather than just consumers of energy. Can you talk a little bit about AECOM's experience in this area and some key points that you see are as really important um, in, in the, for the role of digitalization? Yeah, thanks, Verena, and thanks for the opportunity to, to talk with you. you know, hopefully, I'll build on some of uh, Steve's points. AECOM is one of the largest engineering, planning, and construction uh, companies in the world. We're the first U.S. construction company and engineering firm to uh, set science-based standards for, uh, for uh, greenhouse gas reductions. Uh, and I, at AECOM, I lead our smart energy practice, which means 
uh, in the Americas, it's a focus on how transformation of the energy system and particularly transformation of the electric grid uh, is changing uh, conditions for utilities, uh, energy customers, uh, and communities. And across, uh, across the Americas, that work is driven by three really clear uh, trends. The, the first one is decarbonization of the energy supply. You know, from public policies and mandates to major market movers and individual customers, uh, renewables are on the move and storage advances are really reinforcing the value of those, uh, those renewables. Uh, the second big trend is democratization and decentralization of energy assets. It kind of builds on what, what you mentioned, Verena, about buildings as energy resources. Uh, that, and, and that trend is giving uh, customers more choice in how they manage their energy, and it creates new business models for utilities and, and third-party disruptors. Uh, and then the third big trend that really is essential uh, to making it all possible that, that Steve mentioned is, uh, is digitization of the grid. Utilities have been spending more than $20 billion a year to make the grid smarter uh, and more resilient, and there doesn't seem to be any uh, end in sight, at least for a while. It's a trend that is inevitable, and it's a trend that's essential to the success of decarbonization, particularly when you face the, the reality that, that Steve mentioned, that uh, you really have to scale to make it work. I'll give you an example uh, in, in our business where data analytics and technology are, are critical to, uh, to decarbonization strategies in large commercial buildings. We've done about 120 uh, commercial uh, energy reduction projects in, in big, mostly in big buildings in downtown Chicago and, and in Detroit over the last several years and produced about $60 million worth of, of uh, kilowatt hours of energy reductions. Uh, but increasingly those are reductions are delivered just like Steve said, they're delivered remotely through data analytics, through constant uh, monitoring and, uh, and um, uh, optimization of buildings, we're finding not only are those energy savings significant, uh, that they are persistent and they're persistent because it's easier to get at those savings and to deliver it. What, is that, what does that uh, work tell us? That work tells us that uh, buildings uh, can be really significant resources, particularly the larger commercial buildings, because those are probably the easy, uh, first ones that are easiest to scale. Uh, those buildings can be real assets in a strategy for uh, decarbonization, uh, and that those assets need to be paired with uh, with the electrification of transportation and the significant asset uh, energy asset that uh, electric vehicles uh, can play. Uh, but I, I agree with Steve that in order to do that, we have to we have to set the right policy framework. Most of these advances that have taken place have been driven by state-by-state -state actions, mostly regulating utilities, uh, sometimes going beyond that in, in a few states to regulate carbon, uh, but oftentimes uh, around utility regulation and tied to, uh, tied to things like economic development. They don't address decarbonization head on. And the reality is we need a, a policy framework uh, that makes carbon reduction and decarbonization uh, absolutely uh, direct, clear, and the main policy driver. Uh, decarbonization needs to be directly linked to other measurable policy objectives, uh, most significantly uh, uh, environmental justice and public health. Uh, it is a direct and clear benefit of decarbonization. Uh, and then secondly, as, as Steve pointed out, uh, decarbonization and decarbonization done right has significant opportunities uh, for economic growth and, and economic development, and we don't want to leave anybody behind uh, as we build a as we build a new uh, clean energy economy. So uh, the final kind of policy recommendation or recommendation or, or recognition is that in in a, uh, a federal system with you know about 11,000 units of government, it's going to take concerted, uh, coordinated policy actions by the national government, by individual states and then local governments to really make a difference. And ultimately, it's gonna be a mix of mandates uh, and incentives uh, and leadership by, uh, by example. But whatever the policy framework, it's absolutely clear that technology is here to stay and that digitization is essential uh, to decarbonization. Well, thank you so much. I'm, we're gonna segue right to Annette because uh, Nanette has uh, also kind of a similar um, you know, train in terms of the kind of services that they provide. 
Annette, can you build on what Bill just talked about in terms of the role of buildings, the role of uh, digitization, digitalization, sorry. And really, I think um, some of the, the key points that I know you've raised in the past about um, you know, why this is so important to decarbonizing our economy. Uh, thanks, Verena. And, you know, I, I'd love to build on both of their comments because both of them really relate to what we do as a company. So, you know, train technologies we're known for, for bringing efficient and sustainable heating and cooling solutions to buildings, homes, and transportation. So, but, you know, we've really focused on sustainability for quite a while now. And as we focus more and more on really dealing with climate change, you know, we really start to understand the impact of our actions. So, you know, 15% of the world's carbon emissions come from heating and cooling buildings. And so that really puts us on the hook to try to solve the problem. So in our goal to create smart, healthy, and efficient buildings, you know, we really need to try to figure out how we can focus on our customers in order for them to reduce their emissions. Because our footprint, you know, much like Steve talked about the handprint, our handprint's much bigger than our footprint, and our footprint we've had under control for quite a while, and so the handprint gets a lot more interesting. And scope three emissions are really, they're very important, and they're very difficult to get a handle on because there's not enough data. So, you know, our first climate commitment was in 2014 when we really started focusing on scope three, and it really kind of zeroed in on how to really calculate this, how to move the needle. And as we completed that commitment in 2020, we said, okay, we're gonna strive even harder. And now we have a 2030 commitment to avoid one gigaton of emissions from our customers. And you know, a gigaton is no small feat. That's about 2% of the world's emissions. So it's a very, very challenging commitment for us. And as we look to try to figure out how we're going to achieve it because of course you know we don't know we are really relying on data and the more we dig the more we find that there's just not enough granularity in the data that we need and as you address buildings you know, buildings are incredibly important and if you look at the built environment you're looking at 30 to 40 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. So we really need to focus in on buildings in a granular level. And until we really get more visibility into the generation greenhouse gas profile hourly, we can't really give the building owners what they're paying for. They want to reduce emissions, but we don't really know what the hourly emissions rates are from the utilities. So that puts us into making a lot of assumptions and we, we really need to get more granular about how we're approaching this in a much more standardized way. City by city, state by state is not going to drive the type of innovation that we need. And so we really need a federal program to help us dig in and reduce emissions at scale. So we have lots of technologies, technologies that will actually shift demand. For example, we have uh, the chilled water systems in line with our CalMac ice tanks. What that does is it takes the significant amount of energy that's used during the day, and we can move that energy use to different parts of the day to lower greenhouse gas profile times. Right now we're doing it based on cost. So the owners are saving money, but are we really reducing the amount of emissions that we think we are? So with that, I really look forward to working with this team and others to figure out how we're gonna do this going forward. Thank you, Nanette. There's a lot to unpack there, which we will get to um, in just a bit. I do wanna um, segue to Cameron and Nanette, you talked a lot about scope three emissions and in many ways you are solving um, for um, heating and cooling um, within your customers as there's a lot of focus on making reductions throughout the supply chain. Um, that are other people's suppliers. And uh, Cameron, I th I'd like to turn over to you because I think this is an area that um, Exchange is, is focused on and I think you have a slightly different ap approach to digitalization here, but the topic is related. Um, so I will turn it over to you now, Cameron. 
Sorry about that. Yeah, I was. On, I was now. I'm now. I'm back on. Hey guys. Um. Uh, thanks to CTUAS for for having me and to all the other panelists. Uh, it's uh, it's an honor to to speak today. Um. My name is Cameron Prell. I'm a, a head of uh, legal and policy for a, a expansive CBO holding group or exchange, as uh, Verena mentioned. Um. And so uh, to be brief and to build on what Nanette and uh, and what uh, um, Stephen were just talking about in terms of handprint and scope three. So what is it that we're doing and, and how does it, it relate? So expansive uh, is, or exchange, excuse me, I'll use those terms interchangeably. Um, uh, expansive uh, has embarked upon uh, uh, setting out to map um, the attributional profile of commodities and business activities. Um, and the way that we do that is, is to effectively work with an ecosystem of partners, right, to um, define uh, and productize essentially uh, the digital twin of a commodity or a good and service. And so, from a from a scope three perspective, we're working in reverse. We're starting from the uh, the, the perspective that data is not a service; it's an asset. It's a property. It's a you have property rights in the data. And so, starting at the production level of any good or service, uh, let's just take. Uh, electricity for a moment. At the production uh, site, uh, we are using IoT and AI to uh, uh, capture and, and uh, uh, collect the uh, decision useful information that enables us to create a digital twin of that electron um, or that megawatt hour, uh, de depending on the, uh, the location. And it, just like a renewable energy credit captures that, that uh, the, uh, one uh, uh, megawatt hour of clean energy was generated by a wind farm, we are effectively capturing that plus uh, the uh, other decision useful information about where it's located, when it was produced, and how it was uh, submitted into the grid, such that at the end of the day, we have created a digital guarantee of origin certificate um, that the market can use um, alongside the physical electron. Same thing for natural gas. Same thing for oil, same thing for steel, and for um, uh, agricultural products at, at the moment. And so we consider ourselves a network platform um, that enables companies to capture uh, production level commodity data, uh, convert it into digital assets that then can be registered um, and then transacted downstream such that from a scope three perspective, um, the ultimate end user of those goods and services have that information. They have the right to claim that information um, and they have traceability back to source. Um, and the, in this way, like uh, the uh, ability to uh, create that handprint allows you to productize and monetize that handprint um, and allows, allows companies on the commodity production side to gain a premium out of investing in higher environmental net zero performance. And it allows the end user to uh, map and account for um, their activities all, all the way back uh, uh, to, to source. And so uh, from, a, from a policy perspective, uh, what's the hardest challenge here? Well, the hardest challenge is not increasingly not necessarily the digital technology or the uh, or the uh, uh, escalation of adoption of digital technologies. What it is is it's context contextualization. To Nanette's point, there is uh, there is are gaps in the uh, amount of data that is available. There are certainly gaps in terms of uh, the amount of uh, information that is disclosed. But mainly, there's a lack of a a generally accepted set of uh, climate accounting principles um, that everyone is using such that you can package a digital twin the same way, such that if I'm a, a natural gas producer in the United States, I'm, I'm creating a digital twin that has 12 attributes um, uh, versus um, uh, some subjective number of attributes. And even in that, if, if I'm flaring my methane from a natural gas facility, how am I calculating that methane intensity? How am I calculating that flaring? Where is who is who is uh, exactly funneling that to the gathering station? Is the gathering station also uh, subject to methane restrictions or, or flaring activity? All of the all of these standards um, that uh, are quote unquote the uh, the backdrop of the economy um, are are absent in the in the net zero climate uh, context in a holistic way. It's very, very uh, uh, balkanized in that way. We have some great work on the ISO standards. The GHG protocol obviously is a base, um, but uh, going forward, what we what we see is effectively a next generation of environmental markets where uh, a, a company's uh, information um, is is it's uh, in this regard that maps its full supply chain is its net zero balance sheet. 
such that they are able to uh, uh, kind of overcome their climate related risks and invest in, in a, a climate related impact um, based on their portfolio of digital assets. Um, so that's a, a, a expansive in a nutshell, but uh, glad to talk about the, the policy levers here um, as, as we go forward, Verena, um, the, to talk about what's necessary. And it really starts with that generally accepted uh, uh, climate accounting set of principles. Great. Cameron, thank you so much. We're going to dive into some of the barriers before we get into the policy conversation, because I think what I want um, the audience to really kind of uh, focus on is an un understanding of kind of what um, what are the key sort of barriers and why uh, policy is necessary to overcome them. Before we do that, and I realize I may be beating a dead horse here, but I would love if, if, if folks, if some of our panelists can provide us with just a couple more examples of the role in which digitalization can help to decarbonize. Um, you know, Steve, Nanette, and Bill, and um, Cameron, you all gave some examples, but if I can add a little bit more context um, so that those who are listening who might be new to this topic can get a more holistic picture of like all the different kinds of applications. So I'll open it up and if anybody mm -hmm. wants to, to add a few things. I'll, I'll, I'll start off, uh, Verena, with one example. And I picked this example because it underscores that we're not just talking about climate. There are a set of other related impacts out there that are interwoven with climate. Bill mentioned social justice. That's obviously more and more important. And the link is more and more obvious. Water is what I want to focus on. The water, energy, nexus, as people refer to it in the literature, is getting more and more clear to public and to managers. And in that realm, there are all kinds of ways in which the, the digital water management uh, technologies are starting to take hold among water utilities. And it's all about, as Cameron mentioned, digital twins. It's all about creating a digital twin of municipal water system and being able to see real time what's happening in that water system and to be able to control it real time through the two-way flow of electrons and information. And, um, you know, this is as, as we see increasing water stress through climate change in many parts of the world, the ability to more efficiently manage your water supply and the delivery of water to all the communities, uh, not just wealthy communities, is going to become more and more important. So that's an important example of where the handprint can be applied very closely related. Anybody else? Let's go ahead, Bill. Bill, I think you're on mute. What? You're muted. Hold on. Hold on a second. Oh dear. Um, let me unmute Bill. You guys oh. muted me. <laughs> I'll give you an example where uh, uh, where technology and the ability to manage energy is going to be absolutely essential, and it's around the electrification of transportation. Uh, if you uh, electrify transportation, you place a huge new source of demand on the electric grid. The way that you ensure that that increased source of demand uh, does not run counter to your carbon goals is to make sure that energy use across the entire system uh, is reduced in part by uh, actively managing buildings, actively managing the new load that's going to come from all of that, all of that charging, and making sure that the grid can handle all of that change uh, and and stay uh, resilient uh, and reliable. It's like one of our biggest. It's it's one of our biggest challenges where technology and active management of the grid and individual user is going to be absolutely essential. Nanette, would you, would you like to add? Sure. So just to, to give you an example of kind of what we're talking about, really how it hits home, I, I really like this idea of climate and social justice. And it really shows itself when you start looking at the examples within communities. So we know digital technologies are optimizing building energy use, right, which reduces emissions. So we've reached, we've just reached 20,000 connected buildings and a million pieces of connected equipment. So we're trying to do this at scale. But just for one example, the Crosstown Concourse is in the heart of Memphis, Tennessee. 
and it's a multi-story 1.5 million square foot mixed-use development and it's in the city and it really needed to be kind of upgraded as and they wanted to use it as a catalyst for growth in the community and the arts education and healthcare. so they wanted it to be this vertical urban village and we worked with them very closely we ended up with 1200 pieces of connected equipment and a cloud-based building management system with about 100 energy meters throughout the buildings and we were able to optimize daily operations, track and bill tenant use, uh, troubleshoot issues remotely, establish scheduling, and make sure that we were able to be on site before things went wrong, right? To, to really minimize any type of downtime. So, you know, this really made a difference in this community. It, um, you know, was driven by advanced real-time analytics. So it's reduced three percent year over year since the building's 2017 reopening because it was completely closed down. It's on track to save 760,000 in annual utility costs and it reduces about 8,400 tons of carbon emissions per year. So this is something that, you know, took a dormant building sitting idly for almost 20 years in an area of town where they really wanted to revitalize and bring a community back together. And now it's a thriving, thriving, vibrant Mecca for all walks of life and businesses. So this is where you can use digitalization to truly create more than just energy efficiency. So mm -hmm. I really feel like this is where we put all of these technologies together and we can make a difference. But it was only because the city really wanted to do something. This is not, we weren't trying to meet some particular standard. Uh, there was, you know, a lot of assumptions made on what we were gonna actually get return on as far as emissions reduction. So, but it is evidence that we can do these types of things and make a difference. And it doesn't have to cost the building owners a lot more. It actually has a return on investment. That's great. Um, before I ask my follow-up question, Cameron, do you have anything to add to that? I know you gave a pretty, um, pretty good example um, in terms of how digitalization yep. can. Yep. No. No. I'd be. I'll be re real brief on this. And so, so in in the context of, of uh, digitalization, how can it affect uh, decarbonization? To me, it's a it's an algorithmic governance issue, right? So what's the desired outcome, right? That's zero by 2050 or whatever the policy goal is, right? Or on a corporate basis, what's your science-based target? What's your goal for net zero? First, there you have the desired outcome. Digitalization enables you to achieve that because it allows you to map and manage um, your progression that way algorithmically. If, if things aren't working, you, you tweak this, you tweak that. On the macroeconomic scale, um, the ability of, of digital technologies to network information and to network it in real time and ascribe it to every aspect of, of goods and services as they flow through the economy allows you do, to do a bunch of things, right? It allows you to have provenance uh, such that there's better decision making uh, about on the basis of, of net zero or water, um, as, as, uh, as Stephen pointed out, um, that, that you can make the better decision making, allocate your, your capital towards um, improving the uh, uh, the uh, the health of your supply chain but it also allows the the on the other end of the, the supply side allows them to uh, have an, an economic incentive to monetize their higher performance um, and by by uh, converting data into digital assets that are, are traceable and transactable um, then you can then talk, talk about the ways that policies can lever that information that network data um, uh, across the economy because then you can price at the attribute level, the performance of the economy, performance of a company, performance of an asset, they can all be repriced on the basis of net zero. And moreover, that information can be collateralized such that you can finance forward um, on, on a climate finance basis based on the, the securitization of those digital assets. And so that, that's where I would leave it, but uh, the opportunity is vast in terms of digitalization. So we're going to get to data barriers in just a moment because that's that's the common thread. Before I do that, I just want to ask, and, and again, do we have all the technologies, the hardware and the software available in our economy today um, to enable 
digitalization applications, whether it's grid-based, building-based, um, you know, looking at it from a, you know, the, the greenhouse gas emissions intensity of a, of a commodity. When I think about the how this plays out in kind of our our other parallel, you know, whether we're network connected, cloud-based services, you know, sensors, um, AI, a lot of that stuff is ubiquitous in our lives, which is why I think we're swimming in the water and breathing the air of digitalization. Do we have the, are the technologies available to make digitalization, to leverage it and to utilize it for, for decarbonization already here, or are there technology gaps that need to be filled before we move on to, to our, our barriers and uh, policy discussion? Verena, I think the uh, the answer is pretty simple, and it's yes and no. Uh, um, I think um, you know we're living with a set of technologies today that very few people could have foreseen 20 years ago, and the technology toolkit that we're going to have 20 years from now uh, is probably not foreseeable to most people, except for a few really really smart futurologists. Uh, but I do think the reality is there already is technology in hand to make a huge, huge difference on climate change. One of the things as an economist um, I, I feel strongly about is people only, companies only apply new technologies under two circumstances, generally speaking. One, they have to because of policy mandates or inducements. Or two, there is an economic they could save money. And saving money in the realm, for example, of clean energy is about economies of scale. And so the policies that were put in place after 2008 and some of the tax incentives that have been in place off and on since then have really made a difference in advancing economies of scale for solar and wind, for example, to where now on a levelized cost basis, they're competitive in most places. But there are other technologies that we're talking about in the building sector that have been demonstrated. The problem is there's not a whole lot of information um, out there in the particularly small and medium-sized enterprise communities about what these technologies are and what they can do. Again, from an economic standpoint, it's a market failure, lack of information. So while we, you know, as, as climate policy comes into place and we put more money into research and development and DOE and RPE and other places, we're gonna have a set of technologies in 20 years that'll make even greater difference. But we already have enough kit um, in hand to be able to make a huge down payment. If only we had the policies that pushed those technologies into the economy quicker. Okay. Yeah, I completely agree with that. It's it's fairly clear where the deficiency is, and the deficiency isn't on the technology side. It's the lack of a policy context that puts that technology to work. The reality is we probably have more capacity from a technology standpoint than we're using. We certainly have it in the grid. We certainly have it in the buildings, like Ned uh, said. So if you need to push anything, you need to push policy uh, requirements, both in in business and in government. And I think policy will drive the accessibility piece. Because, you know, just because technology is available doesn't make it affordable or even desirable to everybody. But as soon as you set a policy that creates value for certain aspects of this, especially on the emissions side, that drives demand for technology. And so I, I really feel like policy is necessary in order for us to truly give everybody access to what they need to control their footprints and handprints. Yeah, no, no, this is, I, I would uh, concur with everything that's been said, data governance, property rights to your data, interoperability of, of data flows, the uh, access, accessibility of information, all of these things like need to be addressed in, in, a, in a data governance, digital digital solutions uh, policy framework. Um, but I would say, I would say from a, from a, a market trends. The market is trying vigorously right now to digest climate-related risks, right? Like some people call it ESG, some call it uh, climate risk, but it's generally speaking the same thing. They're trying to digest the long-term, short-term implications of climate change into the market pricing of goods and services, companies and assets. Um, in, in terms of digitalization, the, the role of policy is to enable um, the ability of companies to price those risks, identify those risks, and have transparent access 
to the information that will inform their decision making. And so the, the policy needs to work hand in glove. I, I often say that the decarbonization and, and digitalization are the two things outpacing government. And of all things, they, they uh, work hand in hand together um, uh, when, when it comes to solving the, the, the policy, the policy so, uh, solution set. Let's dive into that a bit more because I've, I've been hearing that um, a data quality data is a huge barrier. And I hear that it's quality data in terms of real time um, uh, energy being deployed under the grid to help buildings be able to make smarter choices. Um, Annette, Annette, I know that's something that you're focused on. Cameron, I'm hearing that you know, their you know, data on sort of commodities and sort of the embodied emissions of products is important. Um, let's talk a little bit more about that because data, which we're surrounded by and swimming in all day, is you know, you can have a lot of data, but if it's not again contextualized, then you're not going to be able to know what to do with it and then to create a value around it. Let's slow that down a bit and look at um, is the data barrier that the, um, the data collection itself needs to be manual or doesn't exist or is hard to assess? Is it that it's being collected and not used? I want to talk about that and then maybe specifically to, to the area that you work on more broadly, or, or sorry, more specifically, what would be a policy intervention that would really help that? Um, and maybe I'll start with, kind of go out of order here. Bill, maybe I'll start with you this time. Actually, if you wouldn't mind, don't start with me because I just uh, I just had a I just had a charging problem and my computer nearly nearly crashed. So, but it's back on now. I'm back. <laughs> Sorry. Then I go first. So, data. You know, talk about the data. The data challenges. Um, you know, why they're. You know, talk about the data challenges and then specifically what would be a policy intervention that would really help overcome that. Are you joking to me? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't hear that. Okay, so the you know the, I don't think the problem with data is that we're not collecting it. I feel like the problem with data is that we don't have consistent goals for what to use it for. So we can collect data all day long. Like I said, we've got a million pieces of equipment that are connected, and not all building owners feel the need to uh, effectively manage every aspect of the building performance. So if we had, uh, you know, some sort of policy that would put things in perspective for building owners, for example, commercial building retrofits, there is very little and fragmented regulation of how these commercial buildings need to be retrofitted, if they need to be retrofitted, right? So it all is, should be based on performance. And we need some sort of guidance in that. You know, numerical targets for commercial building retrofits that would lower operational emissions from buildings this has actually been proposed by the, the Biden plan, right? Four million retrofits by 2025, for example. So if we had some policy that would set some sort of target, then we would have the desire and we would be able to effectively implement something like this and use the data for what it was designed to do. As we measure performance, we need to figure out what we're doing with the performance and where we need to be. So this is something that is just very archaic in the way we regulate existing buildings. And it is just not being um, effectively managed at this point. And it's different state by state. I think uh, I'm ready now, if it's OK, sorry. <laughs> I think uh, data, particularly as it relates to the uh, electric grid, that data privacy and security are, are significant issues, you know, that are, are dealt with by multiple levels of, of government. But the grid is a pretty complex system, subject to uh, threats and risks, and uh, and utilities are, you know, rightly so concerned about how data is used and, and managed, and it has to be addressed in a way that provides both reliability and resilience, uh, and also uh, results in decarbonization. You know, Verena, <clears throat> again, I think the answer in my mind to your question is both yes and no. Um, I, I think in the no category, one area where greater availability of data would be hugely important 
is uh, the uh, greenhouse gas, real-time greenhouse gas emissions from power generators. So as a consumer, uh, whether you're an individual or a customer, you want to be 100% renewable. The reality is now you don't really have much, uh, you know, you don't have much visibility to where the electrons and how the electrons you're consuming are being generated. So utilities need to be required one way or the other, hopefully at the federal level through FERC or at the PUC level, slowly but surely, to real-time monitor the greenhouse gas emissions and make that information available so that consumers can make informed choices. But I want to emphasize the data alone is not sufficient. Uh, one of the members of the Digital Climate Alliance is Water Foundry, uh, based in Denver. And Will Sarney, who heads up Water Foundry, has made a really important point, which is the people systems uh, are as important as the physical data systems. And I just cite one historical example of that. In the 80s and early 90s, when IT started to pervade US uh, manufacturing, US business, economists did not see the productivity gains that they were expecting. Productivity gains are key to people having a better, uh, a better economic uh, life. And uh, all of a sudden, in the mid-90s, give or take, productivity gains started to uh, result. <clears throat> and I think looking back on it, most analysts say the reason was in the early days, they had technology, had a lot of computers, the PC was, was uh, in the vanguard, and companies were automating their systems. But they didn't have uh, the parallel business and people systems evolved to truly take advantage of the data. So the data was there because of the technology, but the ability to use the data was not because the people systems had not evolved as fast. And so this isn't, we talk about technology and the handprint. This is not just technology, it's technology and human systems. And we need to keep that in mind, both uh, as companies and the policy in terms of influencing policy. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, I, I would agree with all that. Verena, real, real briefly, there's there's three moments in history that I would analogize to where we currently sit in terms of the decision useful uh, use of, of that data. Like, so going back to uh, the the uh, analogy that data is the new oil, um, I often I often uh, talk that uh, uh, Standard Oil uh, became one of the biggest uh, companies in the world back in the day, not because it owned all of the refineries, but because it owned the standard for kerosene. Right, that the uh, that the refineries were were uh, were refining the crude too, right? And so all these disparate uh, entities that were creating different oil-based products suddenly had a standard for kerosene that they could they could sell into the marketplace. So the first the first analogy is that is that from a data refining perspective, a data contextualization perspective, we need to know what the standard of performance is for just for buildings, for for, uh, for commodities, for uh, business activities, for investments. We need to have that brown to green taxonomy of the standard of performance, right, that, that we can then identify because to the next point, it's not a lack of data. There are data gaps, certainly, um, but it's not a lack of collecting data. It's a lack of contextualizing data. The second analogy is that the 1929 uh, uh, stock market crash. In 1929, uh, at the time, there were accounting standards that were country specific. So you had Ireland's accounting principles, the U.S. accounting principles, Canadian accounting principles um, for that businesses complied with, right? Um, and that they, they used to book their assets and liabilities. Well, after the, the crash, they, they said, all right, we need to get together and come up with a a national, international, generally accepted set of accounting principles, which led to GAAP. Um, and in, in this uh, digitalization context, we need to do the same thing to account for scope one, scope two, scope three, in terms of a generally accepted set of accounting, climate accounting principles. The third, the third analogy is, is Bretton Woods. So after po po uh, World War II, we got together and came up with what is now the global trade system run um, in large part by the World Trade Organization and uh, each individual government. The base of that is a very large stack of defined products and defined uh, uh, sub-products, sub as well as like all the things that go into making those products. It's, uh, I'm blanking on it, it's like this, the NA, NAICS is in the United States what it's called. Um, it, that, that 
kind of full book of all the products in the space need to be kind of uh, developed for in the in the in the data context to define what is energy efficiency mean what is the hourly uh, uh, carbon intensity of this uh, uh, electric gen set what is the hourly methane intensity of this of this uh, natural gas production facility all of those things need to be defined and stacked such that the market can identify that's what is being uh, transacted, that's what's being booked, that's what's being reported. So, sorry, that those those are all policy things that need to be get done. That's great, and let's let's go there for a minute. There's a couple questions coming in, which I'll I'll bounce back from the the audience that are bringing in. But I want to ask the question of why is federal policy needed? And I and I, I ask this because when you think about other um, drivers in our economy that have led to standardization like i think about the usb port or i think about like you know um you know standard protocols for you know operating systems that kind of thing you know those were developed largely without government um intervention and so in many ways it's like if the need is there the market will fill it but talk a little bit about why why in this case um federal policy is imperative versus kind of allowing the market to kind of develop it in you know uh, it, if you were to put the right market levers in place, let me ask it differently. If you put the right market levers in place, would the market get there, or is there, even if that's the case, do you need federal intervention? Well, the market levers, Verena, I don't think you can separate those two. Um, you mentioned USB, which I know something about, since Intel was one of the principal drivers of the development of that standard. Wi-Fi is another. You know, those are relatively narrow. I mean, incredibly important in terms of how they've improved our, our lives and our technology usage. But compared to what the task is in tackling climate change, those are very narrow, uh, relatively manageable technical uh, problems. We're talking here about the need to, to get to net zero by 2050. We're going to have to reinvent the energy system and the energy system across the entire society. And that, that could happen um, on a strictly private initiative basis. Uh, witness all of the announcements and commitments that companies have been making over the last few years in the complete and utter absence of any federal policy, in fact, a, a negative federal policy. But the challenge is so huge, it really does require federal, uh, federal involvement. And I'll just, I'll just cite um, two specific examples. I mentioned before about the need to drive down the cost of these technologies. And that can only be done, in my view, by increasing the support for it and making it cheaper through tax incentives or mandates to uh, grow the, the market. When the market grows, the, the price per unit for a solution goes down. The second is government procurement. The government is the largest procure, procurer of everything in our economy, the largest landlord, the largest fleet operator, uh, the largest, you name it. And if the federal government can uh, basically uh, give the market um, a, a spur by going out and purchasing these new innovative technologies, demonstrating that they work and documenting the benefits, that alone will provide a huge, huge enabler to the growth of the otherwise private market. So if you just did those two things, I think other things need to happen. Those two things alone. And, and the third, and I'll just mention one, one other. Uh, one, of the, one of the accepted market failures in the economic literature is the inability for basic R&D for companies to be able to internalize all the benefits of their investment. And that's why it's been demonstrated that companies underinvest in R&D. There is an accepted, I think, role for the government to play in pursuing basic R&D in these techno technological areas, because a lot of that basic R&D, which will see the uh, applications of the future, will not get done by the private sector alone, because the private sector can internalize all those benefits. So I think those are three reasons why However powerful the market, a government uh, push and a government involvement is necessary. Hi, Verena. Just just one more comment, and and I really like what I'm hearing. But you know what's happening now is that you've got cities and states that are doing things that should be done at the federal level. So we're we're in, like local law 97 in New York City. They've now capped emissions on large buildings. 
and they're using calculations that you know are are good but is that where everyone's going to go you know, we have so many states and cities that are now pursuing different types of regulations innovation needs to have a home so we want to innovate we want to make sure that we're creating something that's going to be uh, a step change in how things are done but you can't just innovate for one city you've got to make sure that everybody else is going to need something like that because it makes it very difficult for companies to truly make that next step change investment to go after just one small piece of the market and and if that's the way we're going to go that'd be great we need some sort of certainty because it takes years to scale any type of investment as well. And we need we need federal guidance on what's going to be allowed. The communication systems that we develop, are those gonna be transparent to everything else? You know, there's different types of standards that really need to be set. And if we continue on this state by state, city by city approach, it's very confusing for people, it's confusing for us, and it, it fragments the ability to actually create something that would help solve this. And I, uh, I think you kind of raised two issues around, around national policy and regulation, one around the technology itself and one around decarbonization. And it's pretty clear, I'd be much more confident on the technology side of the market being able to respond, but you're not gonna get the type of deep reductions that you need without federal action, without a carbon constraint. You have to create a carbon constraint. And the reality is while cities and states have tried to fit the, fill the bill with their leadership, they simply can't in our system. It's too porous to actually get those decarbonization goals. And the reality of the fiscal stress that most cities and states are now facing as a result of the pandemic and a lack of, um, of federal stimulus and aid to support it is most of them are gonna have to backtrack from an awful lot of their goals and get back to the business of just providing basic services. You need a carbon constraint. If you create a carbon constraint, the market will advance the technology that's already pretty advanced to start with. Yeah, no, I, I agree with everything. Like, uh, I would, I would, I wouldn't I would, call it a carbon constraint. I would say a net zero goal. Uh, what's the desired out? What's the desired policy outcome, right? Um, and that is necessary to kind of move forward towards that that outcome, right? And this, and so that's the first role of, of the federal government is to set that net zero goal. Um, the economy can then uh, either work independently, haphazardly, the way that the, the, the economy works or it can be uh, kind of tilted toward towards that way on based on a, a myriad of policy interventions um, the, the the underlying need then is to is to set a baseline for accounting what's the scoreboard to achieve that desired outcome how do co and in, how does an individual company um, achieve its individual and its its, its kind of a, a, a federal obligation related to that that transition who, who is responsible for um, a certain uh, carbon intensity, the embodied carbon of goods and services, the emissions that go into the air that might be in a different segment of, of, the, of the transition of a given commodity. All these things need to be established by the government to allocate responsibility, identify the desired outcome, and then uh, allow the, uh, the, the economy and the market, quote unquote, to price in that risk. And then, the, so then the, the last point I'll make on policy is that government defines the asset class. They are able to define what the asset class is in, in a given policy intervention, such that then the capital markets and the real economy can adjust accordingly and reprice assets on the basis of the desired outcome. And Cameron, I've got a follow-up question for you. Um, right now, what are you, when you're actually um, evaluating and assessing the carbon intensity of products or commodities upstream, what does that look like um, from a data gathering standpoint and, and where are there specific gaps that you need filled? Right. Yeah. The, the best analogy, because it's first, it's, it's straight in our face these days, since we work a lot with the natural gas industry, um, is is that from a from a, a a production level methane intensity, whether whether a gas uh, uh, a production facility captures or flares flares its, uh, its uh, uh, ex excess uh, methane, um, all of those things can be collected as data points and contextualized and and measured based on credible uh, existing standards. Right. Where where there is a gap. Um, in turn, and this is uh, the, the kind of evolution of digitalization for the gas industry, is that um, that 
by by being able to create that that digital asset of uh, that represents the gas as it leaves the production facility is entirely different than the molecule um, when it's being used at the burner tip at the other side. The reason for that is that the largest amount of, of leakage for of, of methane um, is at the midstream level of the of the gas supply system, and the amount of data there is just not transparent enough or accessible uh, to capture that that methane leakage, right? Um, and so, so ultimately, the market will figure out and be able to price um, uh, that midstream uh, uh, leakage, and the, the data will be collected and contextualized um, and put together in, as a full supply chain. So we're just at that starting point. I, hopefully, I'm answering your question. What I'm hearing, just to kind of summarize before we move on to kind of an, a similar re related topic, but continuing on the co on policy conversation, is I'm hearing that in the policy context, there needs to be a carbon constraint, whether it's a net zero goal or a price on carbon, carbon constraint, where there's actually, um, you're creating a, more, a market for reducing your emissions. Uh, procurement can be a huge lever to, to help advance um, those emissions reductions and di digitalization can kind of help with the implementation of, of, of that. Um, and I guess what I mean by that is that when when the information is more transparent, when the data is there, the digital tools are available to, to, to create those markets. But I'm also hearing just the need for baseline accounting. And just what I'm hearing is the role of federal policy in um, setting the rules of the road, if you will, in terms of kind of how emissions are calculated for different product commodities, for how um, uh, the grid is assessed in real time so that we're all operating off of, of data that we can then commoditize and leverage within a, a policy context. Am I hearing that correctly or is there any other, are there other, um, when it really, as it, especially as it relates to the, the barrier of, of lack of consistency and uniformity in data? Um, any other thoughts on there before we, we jump to the next uh, example of, of a barrier and a policy solution? I just throw out that the absence of a policy context and constraint uh, creates significant kind of unaccounted for liabilities. So there's a risk associated with deferring action uh, and probably a significant economic benefit with having a constraint that puts that externality on the books and gets people to act now before the behavior starts to change. And that, particularly for companies, that, that problem is a, a financial exposure uh, dealing with, with uh, damage and recovery, but it's also a brand uh, and, and company value issue associated with the things that you've invested in and put your money money behind. So I don't think you want to take risk off the table because it is a it is a big issue that only gets bigger with time. Yeah. Maria, yeah. can, can, can ahead, I add Steven. one thing? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, just I want to add one thing. Um, when people start talking about putting a price on carbon, um, alarm bells start to go off in my head. Because a lot of times people, and I'm not referring to folks on this panel, of course, um, are thinking, you know, gee, if we just had a carbon tax, it would all take care of itself, assuming we got the, ta the price right. Or if we just had the right kind of design for cap and trade, everything would take care of itself. The reality is, and, and you can see this in the construction of California's climate change program, um, there are tons of sectors for, for which a carbon price will have no effect for a variety of principal agent issues. Um, you, you have a variety of sectors where cap and trade doesn't really work in any kind of elegant, uh, you know, practical way. And so what we need to do is have an objective in mind, net zero by 2050, but that has to be translated into a number of different constraints for different sectors of the economy based upon the market forces in realities of those sectors. Um, and um, so whenever I think of putting a price on carbon, any constraint you put on the use of or emissions of greenhouse gases in any sector of the economy, any form it takes, that is a price on carbon. It, it doesn't have to take the form of, of, a, of a tax, for example. Yeah, yeah, no, that that's exactly where I was going, Verena, which was uh, to into into uh, Bill's point as well, allowing enabling the market to price climate related risks 
is different than giving the market a carbon price, right? Mm -hmm. um, enabling the market to price climate-related risks is what we're talking about, that rules of the road that, that's necessary, and it manifests in all those carbon constraints that, that Stephen's talking about. Um, in terms of like uh, how that uh, how that redounds, like I'll just highlight that CFT, the recent CFTC uh, uh, report that came out uh, from the uh, subcommittee on market-related climate uh, risk. They identified that the 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 kind of identification of what that risk is, the ability to price it, requires that level of certainty as to what the risk is, right? Um, and so, so first we have to define what the risks are. We have to identify how the risks are measured and valued from a financial perspective, and enable the market to price in all its different fashions that the uh, progression towards a net zero outcome that's established by government. Got it. That's helpful. I want to just pivot really quickly before we talk about grid systems. Um, I want to talk about, uh, this is a question mostly for Nanette and Bill. Um, when we look at um, the sort of building systems that are out there, um, how do we, uh, can you talk a little bit about the human capital aspect of it? Is are people trained to use these systems? Is this something that um, the workforce is just increasingly aware of how to use because we use it in other areas of our lives? Or is this something that requires additional specialized training and opportunities for doing so in different sectors. I'll start with Annette and Bill and then Steve or Cameron if you have anything to add. Gosh, I think from a building controls perspective, I, I think that's been around for a long time, but you know, just like every time you buy a new cell phone, I feel like it needs to come with a bigger manual and a, you know, some sort of tutoring session because I never know what all the devices are doing. So I think there is an appetite for learning the new tools, but these it's not like they don't use them today anyway at some point. How many of us have figured out how to use a thermostat? You know, you, you really figure it out pretty quickly. So I don't really see that as um, a barrier per se. I, I think that the controls and the, the digital world is invading every part of our lives and coming into a new set of controls is something that, that people are getting used to. So I feel like it's it, it's out there. You need training, but it's not as intense as it used to be. Hey, Verena, the, the only thing I would say to add to this is is that even outside even outside the climate economy uh, or the climate context, rather, um, uh, there's increasingly recognition that uh, we're we're governed by algorithms. Uh, by by uh, 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 the, the digital economy is is really governing us through code, um, so to speak. Um, and so so from from a, a human systems perspective, it's it's vitally important uh, to make sure that that those algorithms uh, address our policy objectives, right? And the, and from a net zero context, that algorithms that are going to govern this uh, will be automated. There will be training that's uh, required in terms of the process data science associated with how do you contextualize package and and uh, and uh, uh, transmit to decision useful information. Um, but uh, the, the, the nut of it is is that government has to be a participant in this process to help uh, to ensure that those algorithms uh, help facilitate that drive towards net zero. But, but also, Verena, that's an example. I mean, you used the USB uh, analogy earlier, uh, and I mentioned in an earlier remark the importance of human systems and business systems paralleling the physical uh, technical systems <clears throat> this area of adaptation and, and making um, things more usable is an area where human systems come into play and where there is a role for industry to get together and come up with common standards that are in everybody's benefit because it allows companies to compete on the basis of you know what their technology can deliver not whether it's locked into some investment a company's already made right right well i think we can i want to just take this conversation in the direction of the utility customer relationship and, and the and the basically like how our power is delivered and i think i was reading somewhere uh recently that um you know the collaboration between the electric utilities and startups, you know, while they're essential for digital innovations to be adopted at scale, so this connection between how, how uh, digital innovations are implemented at the utili at utilities, um, that there are cultural differences and sort of true differences on the ground um, that are presenting a barrier. And what I mean by that is that, you know, as utilities seek to ensure reliable electrical service and might 
uh, prior to civility, a lot of the digitalization world is moving very quickly. And so, um, and, and at the same time, there are other constraints and concerns. I think, uh, Bill, you mentioned it about cybersecurity. Can you talk a little bit about that tension um, to the extent that you can about you have an existing infrastructure that is old, um, that is seeking to modernize, it is being in the, in the process of modernizing, and you have these technologies that are, are very nimble. Um, talk about, a little bit about the policy frameworks that are necessary to marry those up, particularly since you're gonna be doing a lot of, whether it's retrofitting old buildings or trying to make the existing grid you know, work for you. We have questions coming in about you know, the role of microgrids and sort of, Bill, you talked about the role of kind of democratization and decentralizing you know, um, uh, util energy. So I just wanna put that out there that there is an older system that needs to be upgraded with these advanced technologies and there that is not happening as smoothly as we would like it to. Can you talk about that tension and the policies that are needed to overcome that? And I won't call on folks, I'll let somebody, <laughs> I'll let someone go first if they want. What the heck, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll wait in. Um, as this Nanette says, I always answer. Sure. <laughs> I'm going to try and hopefully you'll get some. You know, one of the things that as I've gotten more involved in our efforts to try and work with customers in the water utility and electrical utility spaces that I've become aware of is how conservative um, utilities are. And it's, it's, it's by, by nature and by culture. We have this polyglot structure of regulatory um, environments for utilities in this country with PUCs and with FERC and a million other entities out there. And as a colleague of mine once said about a technology we were trying with the water utility in the state of Montana, uh, they, won't, they won't adopt it because it hasn't been uh, demonstrated in Montana. You know, the fact that it had been demonstrated in Idaho was, was not good enough. So I think here's here's a real role for principally DOE and to some extent FERC to help uh, work with uh, the vendors and with utilities to do demonstrations of these uh, uh, you know of technologies that haven't gained adoption and to document their cost effectiveness and the environmental benefits etc. So that um, you know the utilities can go to the PUCs and easily justify investments and get them rate-based, which unless that happens, you know, everything else is, is noise. And I, I, you know, I'm, I just think it has to happen at that kind of wholesale level. Um, and you need to have more than one demonstration um, of a particularly new technology in order to overcome that inherent uh, behavioral conservatism. Yeah, and we have to, remember that the utility business model was based on a, a monopoly, monopoly with one-way flow of power and it served the, the U.S. economy uh, well over a very long period of time and we're talking about something that is very, very different. Uh, and more significantly in terms of reform, those utilities are regulated for the most part on a state-by-state -state basis, uh, which increases the level of complexity. Bottom line, you need to make sure that utility regulatory policies incent those utilities to invest in their customers, invest in their grid, and advance decarbonization. Uh, if you have barriers to them wanting to do that, they're going to do what most businesses do. They're going to invest uh, in things that advance their bottom line. You certainly see in multiple states some great advances uh, that promote uh, collaboration. You see some leading utilities. You know, we work with a number of them. Exelon's a good example, uh, where they're investing, uh, they're investing in grid modernization and connected communities. But it's a system that uh, was built over decades and will take some time, uh, some time to modify, particularly on a state-by-state -state basis. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. That, I mean, that, that's one of the uh, the reasons that we launched uh, Expansive uh, to create that scoreboard. But uh, I, I would say it a little differently. Like I, I'm, I'm quite bullish on on where the, uh, the the capital markets are going in terms of driving down climate related financial risks to companies, including utilities. And the reason for that is is a simple concept. Uh, carbon is is an asset with a uh, a negative expected return. 
right? It's not it's not a liability. It's an asset with a negative expected return. The question is, to to Bill's uh, Bill's point, if they're going to invest in their bottom line, what is their bottom line in a net zero context, right? What is their their their, their bottom line? What does that mean in a in a in a carbon constraint world, right? And so from a financial perspective, allow them to build in the idea that carbon is an asset with a negative expected return exponentially increasing over time. Allow them to price their investments and assets that way, and you will see change. And then you will allow policy interventions to accelerate that change. And so that's all born of allowing them to see the information, contextualize it, and price it. Thank you, Cameron. Lynette, what are your thoughts? I was just going to say there there's such a wide array of utilities and and approaches to this we've been working with some incredibly proactive utilities in california where we're developing microgrids in places you wouldn't think so right so one of our customers is a wastewater treatment plant who would have thought that they would want you know all kinds of different energy uh, upgrades to do that but the utility itself is is looking for it. So lots of utilities in California are looking for it because they have guidance to do so. So even if you look at what the, the PUC has done in California, they're looking for you know, different types of uh, emissions reductions, but they're doing it at a very uh, small increment so that you're capturing the entire profile of the grid out there and the projects are just getting more and more creative all the time. And so we really enjoy working with a state that is absolutely determined to meet their you know, carbon-free electricity goal. So I think that almost has to be done at a state level because if you try to do that at a federal level, you're always going to have the people that the states that want to achieve more and the states that want to achieve less and so you're you're setting the lowest common denominator where you can but i think that the the feds have a role in defining what it is you know what what is the um, what are the emissions worth what are the emissions goals if we had a national goal then each of the states could figure it out but I think that there are some states that are really just outpacing others. And the utilities have been given the ability through regulation and direction from their states to go forth and reduce emissions as fast as they can. And it is really generating some interesting projects. So I'm hearing that there is, there's a need at a federal level to have policy that really sets the rules of the road, that kind of um, looks at the emission factors, emissions um, data, uh, you know whether it's whether it's real-time data for uh, how uh, electricity is dispatched onto the grid to the actual embodied emissions of products that there's a need for a federal role in standardizing those um those uh, metrics as well as you know the federal government can play a role in um again the procurement and as well as setting constraints on carbon itself and then annette i'm hearing you know that there's also a, a need for you know at the state level or more at the local level to really Get at these demonstration projects and steve I'm thinking back to your montana example of you know that there needs to be better dissemination of information again coming back coming from you know a trusted entity like the federal government i want to um we have only a couple minutes left here i want to talk a little bit about and i think this is what the digital climate alliance gets at so steve correct me if i'm wrong but this real i'm hearing that there is success stories but that they're potentially fragmented that i hear that there is an interplay between sectors, whether, you know, who, who knew that Intel was working with, you know, substations or, you know, that Train was working with, you know, a wastewater, you know, facility plant. Um, and, and Cameron, I know that we don't see you on the phone, but, um, but that, you know, you're working with lots of companies that are uh, you know, deeply integrated into their supply chains and working across industry sectors to get at an embodied emissions number. And Bill, you know, you're, as a comms of engineering, you're, you, see, you see a lot of different kinds of, of clients. What, is the opportunity for companies and states and entities to come together? What would be effective ways to come together and tell this story as opposed to through a fragment, fragmented approach? I might be answering my own question, but I'm curious, um, why don't we start with uh, Steve with you um, and then see what other people wanna add. Uh, well, <clears throat> that's a very good question. I, I think one of the things that we've found at DCA is we've interacted with House and Senate staff, and we've been interacting with C2ES and the Innovation 2050 project, is that, and, and C2ES is an exception to this because um, you guys have been on top of the innovation and technology story from the get-go, 
But I think this story, this handprint metaphor and the role of digital technologies is just not yet intuitive to a lot of policymakers. And so, um, you know, the reality is you're never going to have one big, huge, happy coalition that's all going to be rowing in the same direction. You're going to have some fragmentation and you'll have companies like Intel that belong to three or four different coalitions. But I think what we hope to do at, at DCA is to help on the digital content of climate policy to provide a baseline sort of harmonization of what a wide variety of industry sectors are asking for and civil society groups so that you know we're not all we're not all singing the same uh exact tune but we're all in the same key and um and trying to provide some intellectual consistency where we can but you know, the reality is the policy process in washington always has a bit of a tower of uh, Babel or babel or whatever that uh, town was uh kind of flavor to it we're just trying to bring some harmony on the digital part of the conversation. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. Um, what, what, uh, what do others think about that in terms of, of engaging across sectors for this broader goal? Do that so, uh, you know, I would say that for, I, I don't want to call it the first time, but, but typically you see governments, DOE has been, you know, involving different industries in energy efficiency for years across borders, uh, you know, in other countries and trying to bring everybody together. So here you see sort of the lack of that and what happens. So that private sector is now coming together, sees the need and is trying to engage policymakers to move forward in this because we don't have federal action trying to help us. See, digitalization is something that I had always felt was inherent in anything that we were doing, why is it that we have to actually come back and address it separately? How did it get lost in the conversation? It's something that just has not been adequately addressed in all of those other forums. And so the private sector is trying to take the lead and it, it makes it interesting and challenging at the same time because it's new and different. But I think that we are getting a little bit more attention because of that. So I do think I agree with Steve. I think you know organizations like this. There's other organizations where you you can work through these issues and filter in the the, the uh, digitalization so it doesn't get missed again. But you have to have something like this, the Digital Climate Alliance, and with organizations like C2ES that really bring the spotlight in on it to make sure it doesn't get lost further. And I think there's a real opportunity to come together where you talk about how digitalization and decarbonization uh, can create economic opportunity. You know, perhaps if we can get past the election and get to some reasonable discussion about recovery, you can have uh, you can have a really roll up your sleeves conversation about how the technology really unlocks smart energy strategies that reduce carbon uh, emissions and uh, create jobs that, you know, are good jobs that are going to be there for a long time. So I think there's a real opportunity around the economic upside of this. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And the, and the DCA is, in t is uh, I mean, climate policy, it should be omnipresent, as, as should digitalization from a federal government perspective. But uh, carbon constraints, net zero goals are all sector based, right? And so there's a role of digitalization in each individual sector um, that needs to be uh, kind of managed at that, that omnibus level. Um, I would I would highlight for everybody here like uh, what's been done in the, in the in the EU. The EU has married uh, digitalization and their climate policy in several different ways in terms of access of and transparency of data, consideration of property rights, as well as the the ability to create guarantee of origin regimes for products or or alternately the reporting uh, towards what they call their green taxonomy for sustainable finance. All of those things have been intentionally married at the at the Brussels uh, level. It has not been married uh, as yet, as far as I know, um, in Washington D.C. Um, and and that's largely the role of D.C.A. Can can I can I just uh, take quick uh, objection in a minor way to what Cameron just said? I think he's absolutely right of what he pointed out. 
But in other respects, the European Union for 15 years has completely missed the digital uh, boat. Oh, yes. Yeah, um, no, they, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, sorry, I should make that clear. Had, I'm sorry. They, they had an ICT for Energy Efficiency Forum 15 years ago, 10 years ago, that we were the industry co-chair of. And they said they were going to worry about the handprint and the footprint. It wasn't called those things at the time. And it was all about regulating the products. And a lot of that is because none of the, almost none of the companies who are part of the handprint story are European brand companies. They're almost all American, Chinese, or Japanese. And so, you know, to, to the earlier point like Bill made, there's a huge innovation and economic development opportunity here as yep. part of the recovery. Uh, and I'm hoping the U.S. government will realize that. Yep, and, and, and that needs to be made. Is I, I, I'm certainly not ratifying or supporting the, the, that activity. I was just pointing out that the, the digitalization has been part of that conversation. And so and, that's and you're the, right. the, the, the tension at the DCA. And that final point is, is, is that you make about investment and opportunity is an important one because if you consider data and data governance as potentially an opportunity for networking information, supplying it across the um, corporate supply chains, allowing them to uh, uh, create a scoreboard for themselves to manage their climate risk and moves towards net zero, you also have to recognize that it allows uh, the financial sector to forward finance investments that are born of net zero technologies, high performing technologies, and it, it really enables that scaling to take off um, born of the data. Um, and so, so, yeah, no, it's an exciting time. Thank you. We're going to end with one lightning question for all of our panelists because we're at time, and I want to thank um, everybody for a really um, informative discussion and in-depth discussion, but I would like for everyone to think about if there was one policy change that you would like to see enacted within the next two years and at the latest in the next five years, what would that one thing be? Now, I know you might have 10, but pick one. Um, I'll let somebody, whoever wants to go first, go first. Let's go, Annette. Okay. Uh, transparency of hourly greenhouse gas emissions from utility, from utilities. Okay. Who's next? I, I agree. That was going to be my choice. I think that's the number one thing that could be done. Okay, and that would be a, again a federally managed data yes. set. Okay, Bill and Cameron, what do you think? Uh, a clear, uh, a clear federal carbon constraint, uh, specifically tied to, uh, to economic uh, economic development and uh, and public health. I think that's what unlocks the 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 opportunity and puts the technology to work. Great. Yeah, up. those those are those are all good uh, good good suggestions. So it's hard to compete. But I would just say a brown to green taxonomy, a full spectrum definition of of what it on an asset level, what are the uh, environmental impacts of every good and service there is. A brown to green taxonomy. Great. Thank you all four of you. I really appreciate your time today. And for those listening, we will have this recording up on our website soon. Thank you again for your time this afternoon. Um, and have a good rest of the day. With this webinar, we're over.